Good evening, everybody, and welcome to URI Cooperative Extension's uh, Learn at Home Educational Webinar Series. I'm Sage Lannerman, and I uh, work for Cooperative Extension along our presenter, Heather Fober. We're really excited that uh, you all are here. We have 271 people in this space. It's hard to, to feel that energy, but we're all here, and we're all uh, trying to solve some of these these uh, issues that happen in our in our vegetable gardens or our edible gardens, and Heather is here to uh, help us solve and demystify some of those. But before we get too far along um, into the presentation, just a few housekeeping uh, notes for you all, Heather. If you don't mind, just going one forward. Great. So just to familiarize yourself a little bit with Cooperative Extension, uh, Cooperative Extension um, brings science-based university resources to Rhode Island's people, and we've been doing that uh, to all of our different stakeholders since 1914. Um, and we have different, uh, we have a, a few guiding principles that help us along our way. Um, we are committed to improving the quality of life, livelihoods, and the health of our natural environment through our work. We also believe in social and environmental justice, and we strive to deepen our cultural understanding and proficiency while building capacity to create inclusive experiences uh, that address diverse stakeholder needs. And we basically organize ourselves into these areas, uh, these buckets, I always like to call them, of strategic areas of focus. So that would be land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy efficiency, conservation and renewables, as well as healthy lifestyles. So if you visit our website, um, you can click on any one of these pictures or any one of these buckets and all of our different programs will fall underneath there. And we have resources um, for everyone, uh, depending on what you're looking for. So I urge you to take a few minutes and um, explore uh, some of those resources. Great, thanks Heather, one more. And just a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any questions along the way, and I can already see some coming in there, so I'll get to those in just a minute, um, you can just enter them into the Q&A. We're gonna hold questions till the very end, and then I'll, we'll try to get to all of your questions, um, and I'll, I'll ask those to Heather, and we'll have some follow-up resources and, and ways that you can connect back with us if we don't get to everybody's questions. Um, following this uh, session, you are going to get a brief survey and the email, with all things, right? Surveys and Cooperative Extension is very good at uh, disseminating surveys and we read every single one of them and we appreciate uh, your honesty and transparency because we really do use them to help us um, shape our offerings in the future. Um, and this session is being recorded. And if for some reason you're having audio problems or you can't make it through to the very end, uh, you can visit our YouTube channel in just a few days and it will be up there along with closed captioning. And just a shout out to my Master Gardener friends that help, um, they're on the tech side of things and they help with all things related to closed captioning and tech and YouTube. And there's a lot that goes behind this and uh, really, Really proud to be affiliated with that program. Uh, let's see, next slide. And now the real reason you guys are all here is to learn a little bit more about uh, edible gardening and some of the things that can go wrong, whether it be insects or disease, uh, you name it. And tonight's Learn at Home session is being taught by URI's Cooperative Extension, Heather Fober, who is the director of the URI Plant Protection Clinic, uh, which helps to identify insects and plant diseases. Um, Heather has also been helping uh, Rhode Island farmers with pest problems for nearly 40 years and myself for the last 12 years and counting. So thank you so much for that, Heather. Thanks for all you do. And we're really excited to have you here tonight. And the show is all yours. Okay, Sejal. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thanks for joining us here this evening. And uh, what I want to do with you is kind of go through the diagnostic process. So you, you've got your vegetable garden in your backyard, and I'm hopefully going to give you some hints about what you can do um, so you can figure out what's going wrong in your garden. Uh, I also do want to mention, as Sajel said, I do the plant diagnostic clinic. And uh, you know, all states, all the land grant universities in every state have a plant diagnostic clinic and so because i'm thinking that maybe not everybody listening to this is from rhode island but your, your state will have a diagnostic clinic also where you can send in samples to get uh plants you know problems with your plants identified what the problem is so that's that's a big part of my job at uri okay so 
I want to give you some hints about uh, what you should be doing in your garden. And you really want to spend as much time in your garden as possible. You really want to be looking at your plants, you know, several times a week. And this is, you know, besides being an enjoyable thing to do, you can really see what's normal, what, 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 what should be normal for the plants so that if something comes up that's abnormal, you will recognize it as a problem. Um, also, be sure, in, you know, when you're looking at your plants, be sure to look at the underside of the leaves and at the growing tips of the plants. All these are places where um, insects in particular can hide. And then also, when you spend a lot of time looking at your plants several times a week, you will find problems when they're starting to occur. So it's, it's easier to deal with a new problem rather than wait until a, new, a, a small problem has become a big part problem. So looking at things frequently, you'll, you'll hopefully intercept the problem sooner. And then also, it's really helpful to take notes. You know, I'm going to see, can I move this thing out of here? Okay. All right, it's really helpful to take notes that you can refer to year after year, such, such as when you would plant your plants, where they were planted in your garden, you know, when you started harvesting. Um, also describing problems. Often uh, insects will, will kind of appear about the same time every year. So if you're taking notes, you will help yourself in the future about what to expect in your garden. Also, what varieties it, that you're using. A lot of Vegetable varieties have disease resistance in them. And so making note of these things is a helpful thing to do. Also, maybe what you did to try and fix the problem and make a note on, on how well it worked. Also, hand lenses are terrific things. So this little hand lens, a 10X hand lens, I think is really best. And this is a picture of me a few years ago, but see how I have it right up against my eyebrow. And then the, what I'm looking at is less than an inch away from the end of the lens. And that's really the best way to look through a hand lens because you get the widest field of view. So you don't want to be, you know, holding the samples far away from your from your eye, from your face. Uh, you want to hold it just like that. And hand lenses are essential. I'm not sure how anybody gets through life without a hand lens close by. Another thing that I really recommend is making a record with pictures. Uh, pictures you know, are terrific, um, but you don't want to just keep them on your phone and kind of, you know, spin through your phone looking for your pictures. You really want to organize them. So download them onto a computer, put them into folders, give them sensible names so you can find these pictures. One thing that I, I do like, I'm, I'm really not much of a computer person or an app person, but this app is really terrific. It's called Magnifier Plus HD. And it is it magnifies the um, the pictures that your phone can take. And I, I just say make a note down here that it starts at eight uh, eight x you know eight times a uh, closer picture. And you really want to scoot it down till it's about two two x bigger. But you can really take some terrific pictures using this magnifier plus HD app. So before we talk about insect and disease problems and identifying those, I want to talk about some abiotic problems. Abiotic uh, means not living. Uh, and so these are problems that are very common in gardens. Uh, and they it's usually like too much or too little of something. So like too much or too little water or temperature. And then also um, chemicals, too much uh, pesticides or fertilizers. All these things can cause problems to plants and make it look like there's disease problems. So as you can see, this poor rhododendron, not a vegetable crop, but still this poor rhododendron was sitting in mud and doing horribly, so too wet. Uh, these are apples that were uh, got sun scald. So the sun was, was uh, too hot and, and caught, bur actually burned these apples. Uh, this is another, another apple. I, I work a lot with fruit growers, so some of my uh, examples are of uh, fruit trees, not vegetables, but the idea is pretty similar. Uh, so this is um, apple blossoms that have been damaged by a frost. And you can see here, I don't, okay. you can see here the inside of the flowers look darkened. And here, this, uh, uh, this, this used to be a flower bud here, and it was nipped right about there. And the inside of this uh, flower part is dark 
is dark brown. It should be green. This was killed by frost. So this is all frost damage on these apple blossoms. So uh, this was never going to become a, uh, a fruit, an apple. And I think most of these look like that they're dead as well. And that's due to an abiotic problem of being too cold during bloom, going below freezing. Um, also, another different abiotic problem is edges of leaves turning brown like this. Now, in this particular situation, uh, this was a, a, a pesticide that had been sprayed on an apple tree and probably when it was too hot. Um, so sometimes pesticides and, and too hot of temperatures can cause damage to leaves. Uh, drought can look similar to a tree. Sometimes edges of leaves turn brown like that because of drought. Uh, another kind of abiotic problem is, um, again, pesticide being sprayed on to tender plants. And you can see here these edges have turned brown, pretty similar. Uh, but this, these plants weren't uh, in too bad of shape because this, this picture came from this high tunnel and the new growth was fine. So the, the plants grew out of it. Um, but you can still see that somebody might think that that was a, uh, some kind of a disease happening to their tomato plant. When it the real problem is something that was sprayed on it. I get yeah, I, I I see quite a bit of problems with pesticide injury. So this is again blueberries that were were sprayed when it got too hot during the day, like too hot being ninety degrees. You really don't want to be applying any pesticides if it's going to be getting above like eighty degrees during the day. Um, so anyway, destroyed this whole crop of blueberries. So. Also, abiotic problems um, in, in plants, they often will form a kind of a pattern. And so, like diseases and insects kind of hit plants randomly, where if you have problems like a frost or, or a, uh, th this is a nutrient problem, these leaves, you'll often see, you'll often see a pattern. And so, when we're looking at nutrient deficiencies in plants, we want to we, we want to notice whether it's on the older leaves or the younger leaves of a plant, and then also to see whether the, the yellowing or the chlorotic area is uh, like the whole plant or maybe between the veins. This is more like intervenal uh, yellowing on this plant. So this this is a magnesium deficiency. This this intervenal yellowing a little bit harder to tell on this plant on these, but you can see that these. Older leaves are showing this uh, this discoloration, and this is a nutrient deficiency rather than some kind of a disease. Phosphorus deficiency uh, tend to make the leaves turn purpley. You can see the purple color here on these leaves, and tomato plants in particular will have phosphorus deficiencies. What this usually what usually happens is the tomato plants are planted into cold soil early, you know, too a little bit too early in the spring, or maybe the, the ground just hasn't warmed up enough. And when the when the soil is too cold, the plants can't pick up phosphorus properly. And then you'll get phosphorus deficiency symptoms in the plant. It's not to say the phosphorus isn't there. And once the soil warms up, then it will pick up the phosphorus. But this is very characteristic of um, phosphorus deficiency in tomato plants uh, due to cold soil. I love this little picture here. So this is, look, I'm not sure what this language is, but um, so this is showing the different uh, nutrients and where the um, deficiency would be showing up. So the ones up here at top are deficiencies that show up on the upper leaf surfaces, or excuse me, on the, like on the newer leaves. And the ones down here are on the older leaves. Um, and then also pictures of what it looks like. So we were looking at uh, magnesium deficiency. Here's the inter, um, the intervenal chlorosis. So there's all these nutrients, but really these that I've circled are the main ones. So iron deficiency or manganese, both of these in the newer leaves, or magnesium or phosphorus or nitrogen. So this chart isn't nearly as fun to look at, but it really has a bit more information. So again, remember I talked about the upper leaves or lower leaves sh showing deficiency symptoms or showing symptoms. And then all, all across here, it's describing what the different symptoms would look like. And then it's telling you, um, you know, what, so like here's manganese deficiency. You get the yellowing between the veins on the upper leaves. So this, this chart's really kind of pretty help, 
quite helpful for because nutrient deficiencies are, are pretty common in, in vegetable plants. And the ones down here are toxicity. So this one you have an excess of potassium or these other uh, elements, you'll, you'll get damage as well. Okay, oh, so, so uh, here's the uh, magnesium deficiency, uh, excuse me, the magnesium deficiency on the older leaves, you get that intravenal chlorosis, and then it's manganese deficiency, another uh, different element, different nutrient, and that's on the newer leaves, but kind of pretty similar damage as the chart showed. Okay, and then herbicide damage. One more uh, pesticide problem that I see quite a bit, more landscape plants rather than um, vegetable plants, but uh, plants like tomatoes are very, very sensitive to herbicide damage. And so if you spray your lawn with, uh, with some herbicide and you've got um, tomato plants downwind or not that far away, they can get this twisted, turny uh, growth uh, and that's very characteristic of uh, herbicide damage. Now, plants also can have some viruses, and so this can also look like a virus, but usually it's herbicide damage. So let's talk a little bit about diagnosing plant diseases. And when we talk about plant diseases in the vegetable garden, they are mostly um, caused by fungus, uh, different, different fungi. Um, Another type of group of organism that also can cause plant diseases are bacteria. And then, as I had mentioned, some viruses, but these are the, the main three that cause problems for vegetables. And there's the different symptoms of a plant disease. You can have spots or wilts. This is an apple with this is sooty blotch and fly speck and cedar apple rust. And I don't know what else is on here, but lots of different things. But so, but these are, you know, so showing an example of many different kinds of plant diseases, but so they can be spots or wilts. Uh, the diseases can cause plants to be stunted or deformed um, and rots can develop or cankers or, or different lesions, just meaning, uh, you know, damaged spots on, on fruit or on leaves. And so, you know, all, these things are caused by a bunch of different fungi, some different bacteria. Um, but as I said, it's mostly fungi that are bothering our, that are, that are most of the plant diseases. And a way you can tell that you've got a fungi uh, bothering your plant is they generally start at the bottom of the plant and then move up. And you can see this is in my yard. I think this was last year, the year before. You can see that the, the, the leaves, they, they started dying at the bottom. And then just the ones up at the top are, are green here. So this is at the end of the season looking pretty bad, uh, but that's very typical of a fungal disease in the garden. Uh, it'll start at the bottom and move up. Also, if you've got spots on your plants and they've got what's called pycnidia. And so that's what these little black spots are inside these lesions, inside these spots are, these are the fungal fruiting bodies. You know. Mushrooms are, are fungal fruiting bodies. They release spores. Where plant diseases, they also produce uh, fruiting bodies, but they're just pretty, pretty small. So inside here, when, when these uh, fruiting bodies are mature, it will release thousands and thousands of spores. So anyway, if you find spots with these pycnidia inside of it, um, it's, it's, it's uh, an indication that it's a plant disease, a fungal disease. Also, fungal diseases tend to be, some, depending on the disease, depending on the organism, they tend to be fuzzy. So these little spots, uh, you don't have pycnidia, but you'll have very fuzzy looking lesions. This is apple scab. Uh, you may be familiar with botrytis. It's also called gray mold. And so this is what you get on, uh, on your raspberries. If you have a pint of raspberries and they start getting fuzzy, that's caused by uh, botrytis. And, um, you can see that they're the fuzzy growth here. So when you have fuzzy growth, it tends to be a fungal disease. Uh, now it could be that this that the, these are blueberry blossoms. It could be that they died because of a frost or something like that, and then something like botrytis can just grow on top of it. But I think in this situation, it was actually a, a, a true disease organism of botrytis that came and killed these blossoms. So another thing, when you have fungal diseases, there's some that will form these concentric rings, these bullseye shapes, 
um, and that's the fungus sort of growing out from us from a spot in the middle. Uh, this is early blade on on tomato uh, and, and early blade tends to look like this. So if you're seeing these concentric rings on tomato leaves or, or on other kinds of leaves, it's probably a fungal disease. When you have bacterial diseases um, causing bacterial organisms causing disease on plants, it will often form this yellow halo around the spot. Uh, not always, and, and every time you see these yellow halos, that does not mean it's a bacterial problem, but um, it's just, uh, this often happens. Also, what can often happen for bacterial diseases is they can come in from the edges of the leaves. This is a big uh, broccoli leaf here, and these hydathodes, it's called, or on the edges of the leaf. These are um, structures on the leaf to let moisture get out of the leaves. Uh, but also bacteria can, can culture these drops and get sucked back into the plant. And they will cause these diseases on the edge of the plant. So remember, um, I had showed you some leaves that were brown on the edge and that was due to pesticide or that could be drought. Well, it also could be a bacterial problem. And again, you can see a bit of a yellow halo around, around these V-shaped uh, lesions. Um, so more of an indication that it's a bacterial problem. And also bacterial problems, uh, diseases can cause what's called water soaked or kind of rotten looking. So these leaves, you can see that they're, um, yeah, they just look kind of rotten and that's from a bacterial disease. Th this is bacterial spot on pepper over on the right hand side. Again, you see a little bit of the yellow lesion, the yellow halos around the lesions. And uh, this is caused by a bacterium. Also bacterial diseases is the, the, the lesions can tend to be restricted by the veins. And what that means is you can have uh, like this edge here, this is a, a vein right here and the, the, the back, you know, the, the lesion kind of stopped. So here's another. So you have these lesions that are delineated by the veins a bit, and that's more characteristic of a bacterial uh, infection. Again, here we have yellow halos on this. Um, these lesions aren't fuzzy, but, uh, but they, and, and they look quite uh, bacterial to me. Now there's another group of organisms called the downy mildews that are also restricted by veins. Okay, just like here, but these are fuzzy. So these are actually, it's a type of water mold. You may have heard of Phytophthora or Pythium. Those are also uh, water molds are called. And downy mildews fill, fit into that group as well. So the bacterial ones that are restricted by veins, those lesions are not fuzzy, but these downy mildews are fuzzy. Here again, you can see restricted by the veins. This is the upper leaf surface, and this is the lower leaf surface on the right side. So these are downy mildews, and these are real important with um, uh, your 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 squash can get the down can get downy mildews and and also your like broccolis plants like that. So there's several different kind of downy mildews. There's this um, specific to groups of plants, but they can be very important in the garden. Uh, again, viruses. I had a little bit mentioned them before. It's not such a big problem, uh, but when it is a big problem, it's a big problem. So. Uh, the viruses are usually transmitted by thrips, which are tiny little insects, um, small insects, maybe I wouldn't quite call them tiny actually, but small insects and they can transmit uh, viruses. And so these, both these uh, pictures here have tomato spotted wilt virus. There's lots and lots of different uh, types of viruses and not all of them are as picturesque as this, um, uh, but they usually look pretty weird. So what can you do to prevent plant diseases from occurring in your garden? And you really want to prevent them because once you have diseases in the garden, it's much more difficult. It's really, you know, really difficult to control them or to manage them. You really want to be proactive and preventive and try and prevent diseases. With insects, when we talk about insects in a couple minutes, um, insects, you can sort of wait until you see a problem and then do something about it. But diseases, you really want to try and prevent them from occurring. So uh, planting disease resistant varieties is a great, uh, great uh, tool to use. And you want to keep the pl plants spaced adequately. So 
plant diseases, I didn't really mention it, but plant diseases really thrive under damp conditions. So whatever you can do in your garden to try and help dry out the, dry out the foliage, dry out the fruit so that um, diseases don't, aren't so likely to spread. So you want to space, space the plants adequately when you're spraying, when you're, when you're planting them. Uh, you want to keep the weeds out of there. You, you want to spend a lot of time weeding your garden and keeping all weeds out, out of your garden. Um, watering, when you're watering, you want to do it in the morning so that the water will dry off, you know, dry as much as possible. And you really want to, as much as possible, water the soil and not the foliage. Mulch. Mulch is a great way to help keep it, uh, uh, to help prevent diseases. And you can just use um, last year's rape leaves or um, pine needles. I like to use pine needles. I have a good supply of pine needles. So I use those for a mulch and it really helps keep disease down. Um, fertilizing plants properly. If you over fertilize, there's problems. If you under fertilize, there's problems. So really pay attention to your plants and, and give them what they need. Also, I think, you know, rotating your plants. You don't want to be growing the same plants in, this, in the same areas year after year. You really want to try and rotate every year. And then at the end of the season, remove the plants. Get rid of the, get, get rid of the, the stalks, you know, whatever the plants are, just get them right out of the garden. Okay, oh, for, for tomatoes, a good little, you want to, you know, big, huge, bushy tomatoes, you're going to have a lot of disease problems and probably insect problems too. So just removing suckers from tomatoes so you have more simpler plants instead of big bushes. So um, yeah, just keeping the plants so that they're thinner, so that they're not so dense and so they dry out better. And also, if you can see here, cutting off the lower leaves of tomatoes. This is also from my garden. I think this was last year. So cutting off the lower leaves, the plant really doesn't need them. And it really helps the air circulation so that you, um, the plants are drier and you have less problems with disease. So let's talk a bit about insects because it's not just diseases or abiotic problems in the garden. There's plenty of insects out there as well. And so I think you, you know quite a bit of this, but you know, the insects have different mouth parts. And so they, the, depending on their mouth part, depends what kind of damage they, they uh, they, they can uh, do to a plant. So um, insects, uh, you know, chewing insects with chewing mouth parts can uh, cause holes or, or um, you know, bore into stems. Uh, and insects like this are like caterpillars or beetle larvae and also beetle adults. Then there's some insects that have what's pierce, called piercing sucking or rasping mouth parts. And these can cause, these are like leaf hoppers or thrips or mites or uh, some scale insects. And these can cause what's called stippling damage. And I'll show you some pictures, but it, the chlorophyll gets removed from the leaf by these sucking insects. So a sucking insect, a mosquito is a sucking insect, sucks your blood. These sucking insects suck the um, plant juices and, and chlorophyll out of plants. There's uh, leaf miners that, that there's several different Families of insects that can be leaf miners, where the, the larvae feed between the, my, the layers of the leaf. Um, other kind of damage is uh, aphids, can, are, they're, they're sucking insects, but they also, they suck in a lot of plant, plant juice and out the other end comes honeydew. And on that honeydew, it's very sweet and sooty mold, black sooty mold can grow. So aphids can do this, but also white flies or some soft scales also can produce this honeydew and then uh, we can get sooty mold growing on that. Uh, mites, they're not insects, but they're pretty similar and we can consider them mostly like insects and they do similar damage to the rasping or the piercing sucking. So we'll have stippling or what's called bronzing or uh, some other ones, I'll show you some pictures. Okay, so here's some Chewing mouth parts, holes in leaves. I think most people would say, okay, that looks like an insect um, chewing these holes. And that's a soybean looper that sometimes can build up. This is on uh, green beans. So again, these holes, it could be caterpillars or, or beetle larvae and adults also can chew holes like this. But also slugs. Slugs, slugs can be uh, difficult to diagnose. Uh, 
they, they you know, tend to hide during the daytime unless it's really wet out. So if, um, if you're seeing holes and, and you're not sure, uh, you don't see any insects out there, you might want to um, go out in the evening or go out when, uh, when like it's very, very humid out. So, and look for these. You can also put down like boards or things to, um, you can put a board down in the garden and then the slugs can go and hide under that and you can take a look to see if you do have slugs. Uh, the piercing sucking mouth parts, you can get this stippling damage where the, the chlorophyll gets removed from the leaf. This is actually more like what we call hopper burn and the edges of the leaves are really quite yellow, but you can see these leaves have been discolored and this is from insects. And you wouldn't see the insects unless you would flip over the leaf and look on the underside of the leaf. Another kind of um, the stippling or uh, caused by these rasping or sucking insects. Again, the chlorophyll just getting removed. Um, here again, this is just a little bit of slight discoloration. Uh, mites in particular, two spotted spider mites. I think that's what this damage is on these beans on the left side here. Two spotted spider mites are pretty small. Uh, use that hand lens. That'll that'll help you to uh, to see them. But that's the kind of damage they can cause. There's also some other mites called rust mites, and these will cause what's called bronzing. And so, and they really discolor. If you take a look at the stem of this tomato plant, um, it's really kind of brown looking, or kind. Of, sometimes it can look kind of orangey or, or, or uh, bronze colored. Um, and this is typical mite mite damage caused by rust mites. So there's also this other kind of mite. That are that are microscopic. You can't see these through their 10x hand lens. You need to get them to a diagnostic lab where they can look at them with higher magnification. Um, but these are microscopic mites that tend to live in the growing points or like underneath the sepals of this pepper uh, of this pepper fruit. Um, but you'll get on peppers. This is pretty common. Um, I see this quite frequently on peppers. You'll get this really callous tissue. Uh, and you don't know why. Also, another symptom of these microscopic mites is what's called strappy leaves. And that just means here, here's a normal leaf and the, the, this leaf has been um, deformed by these uh, microscopic mites, these broad mites or cyclamen mites, um, and they cause what's called strappiness. So they're long, skinny leaves. So I have a picture here, some, some broad mites over here and cyclopin mites over here. Again, you really, uh, they're very hard to see, uh, but they can cause a lot of damage. Uh, aphids, as I had mentioned, they suck on a lot of plant juices. Uh, here's an aphid over here. I don't know if you can see, this is a little bit shiny looking over here from the honeydew. And this is the black sooty mold that can grow on the aphid honeydew. Um, the, the little white things here are cast skins, so the shed skins of aphids. And that is very characteristic of, of aphids. If you're seeing um, a lot of these little white things, especially if it's stuck in some honeydew, um, good chance that you've got some aphids going. Okay, and aphids, you know, aphids probably know what they are, but they're quite small, what, eighth of an inch or, or smaller, um, soft-bodied insects. And they have these tailpipes, they're called cornicles, but all aphids have these cornicles, these tailpipes. Some of them are really sh short, they might look like little buttons, and some of them are rather long like these here, uh, but all aphids have these cornicles. And, and all aphids produce honeydew. So another kind of insect damage can be the leaf miner. So as I said, um, leaf miners, the larvae, the immatures mine between the layers of the leaf. And this is the, uh, the spinach leaf miner. Here's just a little bit of damage. So here are the eggs over here. They're pretty tiny eggs, but they are worth looking for because if you find the eggs, you can just squish the eggs and then you won't have the, the larvae. Uh, these are, it's a fly on for um, the spinach leaf miner. You, uh, yeah, you can, you can avoid this if you go looking for those eggs and squish those small white eggs. So that here's just a few mines here. Here's a mine here, here, and up here. Over here, this whole leaf is destroyed by spinach leaf miner. So especially if you've ever grown spinach or grown Swiss chard, uh, it's likely you've encountered the, the 
spinach leaf miner. So for most insects, they've got four stages of eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults. Uh, these are caterpillars. I think these are um, uh, salt marsh caterpillars, which they, they feed on lots and lots of plants. Uh, but then, so all these insects also have eggs. And really, this is where looking in, looking in your vegetable plants is and looking on the underside of leaves, because just about all eggs are laid on the underside of leaves. Um, this is an imported cabbage worm egg. This is Colorado potato beetle egg. This is three line, um, three line potato beetle egg and squash bug eggs. So you really want to look, look for eggs because you go and find the eggs and you squish the eggs, you're getting rid of the problem there instead of waiting for the larvae to do damage once the eggs hatch. So look, you know, look on the underside of leaves for the eggs, um, but then the larvae can be anywhere. So to be looking for larvae here, here's the leaf miner inside the leaf. This is a, what is this? So I, I'm not, I forget what this is. Actually, it could be a um, corn borer. No, I'm not sure. Anyway, it could be inside the pepper, but there was a hole out here letting you know that there was something inside there. I should have known what that is. Sorry about that cross-striped caterpillars in your cabbage plants. We just started seeing this around, what was it, 2010 or so, maybe a little earlier, 2005, these cross-striped caterpillars do a lot of damage in cabbage and, and other uh, related plants, broccoli, things like that. Uh, this is a corn borer inside a stem. So literally larvae can be anywhere. But the pupae, the, the, the pupal stage, often you find these are, have been, uh, they've pupated, the insects have pupated on the underside of leaves. Uh, so that's where you, you might want to go and find a pupal case and destroy it. And then adult insects, most of them can fly. Um, so they will get around three-line potato beetle, Colorado potato beetle. This is, this one can't fly. This is a winter moth, near and dear to my heart not a garden vegetable pest, um, uh, and they don't fly either, but the males do fly. Uh, one insect in particular I wanna mention is the Asiatic garden beetle, um, because these can do a lot of damage and they feed at night, so you just might not even see them. And they feed on hundreds of different plants. And, and so um, when, when somebody has a garden and, and lots and lots of their plants look like this leaf, I first assume it's going to be the Asiatic garden beetle. Now, slugs could also be like this. I think slugs don't like as many plants as the Asiatic garden beetles do, though. Again, I had mentioned the three line. Oh, I love this picture up here. I don't know if you guys are seeing this or not. This, maybe I can get rid of this. Oh, huh, I could have done that a while ago. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, this is a three line potato beetle. I get a lot of these on my potato plants every year. They, they, uh, the female deposits eggs on the underside of the leaf in these very straight rows, very organized. And then this is what the larvae do. They feed all together like this in a line. They stay together and, uh, and well, not only do they do that, but they throw their frass or their poop on their backs. Good defense mechanism. Um, sure, <laughs> it keeps me away from them. Um, so anyway, these are three line potato beetles. Colorado potato beetles, you're probably more familiar with if you've grown potatoes or tomatoes or eggplant. They really like eggplant, but here's eggs. Uh, this is the large larvae um, and, and then a couple of adults here and over here. So they can totally decimate tomato plants, not so much tomato, but potatoes and eggplant in particular. And they can do a lot of damage in tomato plants as well. Again, if you get in there and find the eggs first and squish them, you would still have beautiful plants. Uh, squash beetles, they also have cute little yellow eggs and the larvae are rather adorable. These are, they look very similar to Mexican bean beetles. They're closely related, but these little spikes on the larvae, um, but they can do a lot of damage to squash plants. And as I mentioned, the cross-striped caterpillar. So the, um, Cross-striped caterpillar, they, 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 their, egg mat, their, their eggs are laid in a mass. And so you get lots and lots of caterpillars all feeding together. 
and they'll do a lot of damage like this. Where it's something like the imported cabbage worm, they lay single eggs, so you tend not so much to have uh, damage like this. And aphids, as I mentioned before here, are those tailpipes, those cornicles. Um, again, if they're usually on the underside of leaves, sometimes in the growing tips, uh, sometimes on the stems, but that's where you want to look for them. And again, the honeydew, they, they give off this sticky honeydew. That's a better picture, really showing you. It's really like sap. So let me show just a few pictures of some good insects so that you know that you're looking at the good guys. And I think you recognize the ladybug. This is a newly emerged ladybug that the spots haven't even developed yet. But this is the pupil case. This is a pupil case of a ladybug. So if you're seeing something like this, it's attached to the leaf. Um, you've probably got ladybugs there too. Uh, surfeit flies are a, a, another beneficial insect that um, the adult is a, called a hoverfly. It's a fly, it only has one pair of wings, unlike a bee that it's mimicking, which would have two pairs of wings. Uh, and the surfeit fly lays an egg, and here's a surfeit fly larva over on the left side, and they really like aphids. So if you see a bunch of aphids, take a look closer and see if you see some surfeit flies also feeding on them. There's also an orange, uh, uh, another kind of maggot that feeds on aphids. So, and, and often these, these two predators, um, the surfeit fly and this cystodomyid fly, it's called, um, can really clean up aphids. So if you've got these predators in there, what I usually tell people, if you've got a bunch of aphids, but you've got some predators, wait a week, see if they totally clean up the aphid population before you do anything. Uh, ladybugs, I think you're familiar with the way the adults look. Here you can see a little bit better maybe how that the, the shed skin of a pupa looks. But then also you need to know what the larvae look like because they're the really the workhorses. And they look like little alligators. Here's two different species here. When they when they're first when they first hatch, they're black and then they gain color as they get older. Uh, but the eggs, the eggs of these are, they're, they're similar, they're related to like potato beetles and Mexican bee beetles. So it's a little hard to tell the difference between the different eggs, um, whether or not they're ladybug eggs. So if there's, a, if there's a bunch of aphids and there's eggs like this laid nearby, then it's a good chance it it's, could be a ladybug egg, egg mass. But if there's no aphids around, um, it's, prob it's probably a pest. Another beneficial insect is the lace wings. And here the, the eggs are just these dramatic, beautiful things, uh, very delicate. Here's the adult lace wings. You can see where the name comes from. And then there, this is the larvae of the lace wings. And these really look like little alligators. And they're voracious feeders, uh, wonderful, beneficial to have in the garden. Another one you may have seen this again on, this is on a tomato hornworm. Uh, parasitize. You can see all these. These are little um, paras uh, the the pupae of of a wasp, and all the little caps. The wasps have already emerged because you can see their little escape hatch has been cut open. Uh, but these are good guys. A little scary looking, but uh, good guys in your garden. Oh, and I, then everybody should know what this is. Also, this is uh, the praying mantis egg mass. So they look like styrofoam. So this is pretty big. This is, you know, probably an inch or so in, in length and uh, good, uh, good to have in the garden or in your yard. So I, I always like to mention, actually, this is something I learned from Sagel. Whenever you're doing uh, searching for something online, put the word extension on the end of it. And that will give you fact sheets from universities, from cooperative extension. So you know, the internet is pretty darn amazing and you can just write in descriptions like, you know, yellow caterpillar feeding on broccoli. Uh, anyway, uh, just putting in search engines, excuse me, putting in search words and putting the word extension on the end will give you some good fact sheets. And really for good fact sheets, you really wanna be looking close to home. Now, sometimes a California fact sheet will be very helpful for a problem in Rhode Island, but mostly we want to be close to home. So New England or New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, really most of my favorite um, fact sheets come from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. They have terrific fact sheets. 
Hey, one other thing I want to mention is I this year I, I have organized the Rhode Island Farm scavenger hunt for the last. This is going to be my 11th time and actually my last time doing the farm scavenger hunt because it's it is so much work, but it is, but it's fun. I've loved it, but I, I, this, I'm doing 11 and that's this is my last one. Uh, you can go not quite yet. Uh, it starts in May. Uh, it goes from May till the end of the year. And you can go to the Rhode Island Fruit Growers um, website to see which farms are participating. So this is a brochure and you open it up and there's 32 participating farms. And uh, and then what, you, what it is, is there's um, a picture for each farm. So you go to the farm that's on that last list and you go to the farm, you match a picture to the farm and then you get a sticker. And if you go to 20 or more farms, you're eligible for a prize if you go to all 30 two prize all 32 farms you go you you're eligible for more prizes and for the grand prize so uh rachel uh rachel uh, sagel this is this is where you step back in <laughs> yeah my computer stuck for one second heather that was great it's my i don't know why my video is not popping up um oh it's coming there we go that was great Thank you. Um, totally different world underneath that hand, hand lens, huh? That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I got you hooked on uh, extension searching online and you got me hooked on my hand lens. So that's, okay. a, that's a fair exchange there. Fair exchange. <laughs> so I will go over these resources just really quickly because we have so many uh, like questions that have come in. I doubt that we'll be get be able to get to all of them. So I really wanna plug our website, which you can see here, but also take a look at that second star, the Gardening and Environmental Hotline. So you want to bookmark, you wanna save this as a contact, uh, contact um, in your email, that gardener at uri.edu. This is such a great service for folks that live here in Rhode Island and, you know, and, and Near, uh, nearby states as well. We have a team of URI Master Gardener detectives that are trained to answer these questions 24 seven year round. You can send them your pictures, uh, what, you know, your pictures, whatever, whatever the case is, your, your issue that you're having. Um, and when they can't solve it, they're able to connect with the experts like Heather. So if we don't get to your questions right now, please feel free to email gardener at uri.edu uh, with the questions that we don't get to or anytime in the future. Um, so Heather, are you ready? We have some questions. Sure. <laughs> I'm trying. So I recorded most of them. Um, and I think a lot of them you ended up getting to so if you felt like you dealt you you answered it i was kind of busy behind the scenes we can kind of just you know go through it a little bit quicker um there was a lot of questions on uh the japanese versus asiatic beetle if they're the same and you know folks are just kind of curious what what else can they do? Are there preventive measures? A lot of a lot of folks got their, you know, their plants decimated, and it's a uh, something that keeps coming yeah. back every year. Right. Well, so the, the Japanese beetle is that iridescent greenish brown beetle that you'll see come out uh, usually around the Fourth of July. We start seeing them around here, and they they will get on raspberries and on grapes, uh, and some other things. Honey crisp apples. If you grow honey crisp apples, they love honey crisp. Um, so anyway, the, the, those are the Japanese beetles. They are out in the daytime. You see them, you know when they're there. The Asiatic garden beetles are really, I don't know if I could go quickly back to where that picture is. Maybe not, but it's uh it's it's um you know about the same size, but these are really round. They have they're they're very, yeah, I don't know what how else to call them, but really round beetles. But you rarely see them. When where you do see them is they might be bouncing into your screen at night or you might find them on your windowsill because they are out flying at night. And again, I, they have a huge host range and just feed on everything. And the roots of excuse me, the larvae of both of these beetles are grubs and they feed on roots in the soil. Um, so plant roots in the soil. So what can you do? Japanese beetles are easier to manage um, than the Asiatic garden beetles, uh, but they're they're hard to control. They're hard to kind of hard to control with pesticides. You can get stuff that's called um, row cover, or it's called remay, R-E-M-A-Y, and you can cover your plants with this remay to keep 
um, you know, Japanese beetles or Asiatic beetles off of the plants. Um, I am not sure where Asiatic garden beetles spend the daytime. So if they're in the soil right below your plants, putting a, a row cover on them might not be the best thing. So you would just want to make sure that you're not making the problem worse with using row covers. Um, Okay, so how does that sound? Great, okay. thanks. So then we also have some questions on powdery mildew and if you have any good tips there uh, to deal with it or perhaps prevent it in the first place. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, fungal diseases and bacterial diseases, they happen when conditions are wet. Powdery mildew is really the only disease that just likes high humidity, but it doesn't need really wet conditions. And actually it's usually worse on a dry year. Um, but there are lots of uh, things that you can do for, for powdery mildew. Insecticidal soap. Uh, there's an insecticidal soap called MPED, M, or capital letter M dash P E D E, or other insecticidal soaps really work very well against powdery mildew, as does like a refined horticultural oil um, called like a sun oil. Anyway, uh, oils work very well against powdery mildew. So I would try one of those. All right, terrific. Any uh, tips for chipmunks and squirrels eating uh, tomatoes? <laughs> we have this yeah. problem as well. You know, we have great fencing, keeps the deer and other things out, but doesn't keep those chipmunks uh -huh. and squirrels out. <laughs> you know what? I don't have any good ideas about that. Yeah. I mean, maybe the, maybe the remake could help, you know, you could um, try really covering the plants more than just the fence, but what's worse yeah. is that half the time they just take a bite and then they're yes. off just a bite. Yeah. I know. Sometimes I want to leave out a bowl of water. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's see. We have um, some broccoli broccoli problems. So, uh, you know, uh, let's see. So this person had some very large, healthy looking broccoli plants uh, this past summer, but never ended up getting any fruit. Some of the leaves started to whiten. Maybe we added too much nitrogen into the soil, but it could have been something else. Yeah, I am not sure, you know, what would cause, it could be a nutrition thing that would cause the, um, the heads never to form on the broccoli. I am not really sure. Sajel, do you know? Do you know what would cause that? You no, know, I did get a good tip from Andy Raiden one year when we had some broccoli issues, because I think sometimes we tend to put broccoli in this cold, hardy category. Um, when we do a later later planting, once it's established, it can kind of tolerate those colder temperatures. But sometimes when we start our earlier starts and we put them, you know, before the nighttime temperatures are 50 and above, they can actually get stunted. So Andy Raiden had told me, don't put your broccoli, your seedlings out so early. Wait until end of May, wait until beginning of June when you're putting in those tomatoes and peppers and, you know, the, some of those plants. And that, that worked for us. We actually had some really nice broccoli two years ago, but last year we had no broccoli. So I don't know what we did. Yeah. <laughs> it's always something. It's a good year for something one year. And, you know, and I think that's, that's, that's how it goes sometimes. That's gardening. That's gardening. Well, thank you. No, that sounds good. I was going to say, I wish Andy was here to see what he would say about that. So yeah. thank you. Uh, let's see another tomato question. So uh, tomatoes that crack often um, as it gets time to pick during the summer. So some varieties just tend to do that more, uh, more than others. And it's certainly a lot of the cherry tomatoes or small tomatoes, well, they're, they're just prone to cracking. And often what it is, is when they get water, when they when the roots pick up water, they'll tend to crack when it gets close to, to uh, harvesting. So I would say try and select a variety that's not prone to cracking. And then also try and keep the plants well watered water every day or every other day don't let them dry out and then uh water them heavily so more consistent watering could be helpful great folks uh, really loved um your diagrams and some of those diagnostic charts i know that they'll be available you know if folks watch the recording later but if people wanted to find some of those fact-based things that you were sharing where would they would they turn to well, um, can I give them to you to upload on? That's what I was going to say. Yes, I'll get so, them to you. 
All right, that sounds great. So folks, if you want some of those specific um, charts and the diagram that she showed with the nutrient deficiencies, you can email coopx at uri.edu or gardener at uri.edu and they know how to get those uh, to questions to me and then we'll get you those resources. Very good. good. All right, terrific. Let's see, just a few more. Let me try to pivot here. Um, oh, we had a, a bunch of questions when you had mentioned pine needles. Um, folks were wondering if they use pine needles as mulch, is that going to um, add to the soil acidity? No, not, you know, not much at all. It's not a problem. They're pretty inert, <laughs> you know, they really break down very slowly, so. Yeah, great, I, I always say this. Same thing with composting as well. Folks get a little nervous by adding that to the compost process, but it's 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 good to go. Yeah, no, it works really well. And for me, I have pine needles that land on my driveway and I can just sweep them up and get big, huge piles. It's wonderful. Yes, I love free mulch, right? Yeah. Um, let's see, a couple questions about insects. Aphids, can they be orange in color as well? I'm glad they asked this question, yes. So, um, Different species can be different colors, but like one species could be green or orange or yellow. Or, I mean, they, there's a big variety even within the species, but yes, aphids can be all different colors. They can be black, they can be purple. So that, you know, they're small, they're soft bodied. The only really consistency besides those is those tailpipes, those cornicles at the back end. Um, but they're soft bodied insects. So yes, all sorts of colors. Great, and sticking with insects, um, any good tips for a lot of folks are protective of our pollinators, of course, so they wanna make sure that they're squishing the right bugs, the bad bugs. So any good tips for making sure that we're not squishing any pollinator eggs? So the pollinator eggs, we're thinking more bees and things like that. So yeah, you're, they're not laying eggs in the garden. So you're not getting, you're not harming pollinators when you're squishing the eggs. Yeah, the, the only real, um threat is you know getting squishing like ladybug eggs versus pest eggs and it's hard to tell if you really wanted to be conscientious you could pick the eggs and put them into a jar pick the leaf that has the eggs on them put them into a jar wait to see what hatches out and if it looks like a ladybug larva you could put them back in your garden and if it's not uh you could squish them um, but if you're seeing a lot of eggs masses or, or even just a few egg masses and there's no aphids there, like the ladybugs aren't going to lay eggs um, where there aren't aphids, where there isn't going to be a food source for them. So if you're just seeing eggs, they're probably pest eggs. Okay, that's smart. And that sounds like a fun thing to do with uh, my kiddos. Oh, um, hatch, hatch some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, just a few more. Um, I, I prefer to grow organically. I have insecticidal soap. Curious if there's other things that you would recommend to kill bugs, maybe besides our hands, which is the best, <laughs> best friend of an organic <laughs> grower, any grower for right, sure. Right. Well, the insecticidal soap really does work uh, very well. Um, and, and as, as uh, oil, you know, oil can be helpful also for killing insects, um, especially like mites, but you really need to be, you know, getting it on the underside of the leaf. Uh, there's another, there's a um, organic compound called Entrust, or it's a spinosad product. Entrust is for commercial growers. It's really expensive. There's a there's a um, homeowner formulation called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, and this actually it it's not um, it what it says it's it's for organic production, so it's not really OMRI listed. I'm not sure if organic commercial growers could use it, but it's a, it's the same thing and it's for organic production. Anyway, a good insecticide kills a lot of insects. It will kill some. Colorado potato beetles when they're when they're small larvae, um, but yeah, but but getting out there and looking for the eggs and getting those eggs, you don't have to squish the eggs. Actually, you could just pick off the leaf or part of the leaf that has the eggs. Um, but getting out there proactively and getting rid of the eggs before they hatch is a really good thing to do. Yep, I completely agree. Um, and folks, I did just put uh, gardener at uri.edu into the chat. 
um, just so that you have it there. Someone had requested that. Um, we have a couple fresh questions coming in. Um, so many people are so grateful for this information. Um, how can I use diatomaceous earth? <sighs> so that can help with uh, like slugs. You know, so the, the diatomaceous earth is really rough and the insects or the things don't like to crawl across it. It's really not very helpful against insects, but things like slugs, it can be helpful. Um, there's also for slugs, there's um, iron, the iron phosphates, whatever's in sluggo um, works really well for, for getting rid of slugs. I am, I'm not positive it, it can be used in the garden, but you could use it like just outside the garden. I'm not, I should know about that, but I don't. But sluggo is a good way to get rid of slugs. I, I, so I, I don't know what all you can do with diatomaceous earth. I'm not sure there's, there's too much to really help. Yeah. What about snails? Would you put that in the, we had a couple questions about snails. Same thing. Treat right. them like slugs. Yep. Yep, those soft body and diatomaceous earth works well. Yeah. Um, okay, and what about uh, plants that have bacterial issues um, or other other disease? Uh, should you throw them out? Should you compost them? What do, what do we do with diseased plants? Okay. So if it's for the fungal diseases, as I was saying, you know, cut, picking off the leaves that are showing damage or, or with the tomato plants, getting rid of those lower leaves so that you're helping with air circulation and you're getting rid of some of the disease organism. That's a good thing to do. Um, bacterial ones, that's more internal. Uh, if you want to spray some pesticides, so there's uh, organically approved copper sprays and those are really good um, for, well, for fungi, but also for bacteria. But remember, you really, uh, it is, uh, the, the diseases are difficult and you really need to be doing it preventatively. It's really hard to clean up a problem. Um, so if you, if you, you know, if you're intending to spray, uh, you know, the time to do it is before you, you see the disease, Bef right before you have wet weather also. Um, I know a lot of people, if they're going to spray pesticides, they're like, well, I don't want to spray it before the rain because it's going to get washed off. Well, when you're spraying a fungicide or a bactericide like copper, the time to spray it is before before you have the rain event so that you're putting on chemicals that can can protect it. Um, so what else can you do? Uh, yeah, did I answer the question, Sajel, or does? Yeah, I think I think so. I, I think, you know, so much of this and so much about learning to be a good gardener is is really getting out there even when you don't have stuff to pick or stuff to weed and sort of just hanging out with your plants and and you know i i i love this field because i'll never learn it all and i'm always learning something new every year so i think i saw one comment that someone left wow this is such great information i'm getting overwhelmed with the information and it can seem like overwhelming at once you know we were trying to collectively absorb all of this but just knowing that, you know, folks like you and the master gardeners and people are there to help us along the way when we don't retain all this information. So I just want to urge people that it can get a little overwhelming, but, you know, you, a lot of us have a smartphone in our pocket or have a digital camera. So, so going out there when you are confused and, and taking pictures, you know, uh, uh, when you send pictures to us, giving us something to um, reference the size. So if you have like a penny or a coin or a pencil, putting that next to the things that you are taking pictures of really helps us get to those answers quicker. So um, I think you did answer the question uh, beautifully. And I also just think that there's just this learning curve and we just need to access our extension resources and wholesome gardening information that's on the web to help us get to the bottom of it. And a lot of it you do retain, because I think you do tend to have a lot of the same, you know, things that kind of creep right. back. Um, so it's, you know, where some folks might have issues with, you know, garden beetles, some of us might be dealing more with chipmunks and wildlife issues. So we don't have to know all of it either. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Well, Heather, this has been really fun. 
Um, there's so many more questions, but I think we would be here all night. So I think I, I'm not going to plug the hotline in one more time, maybe one more time, because you're going to show <laughs> us those ending slides there so folks can connect back to us. Um, so we'll put that up there one more time. Remember that uh, this is recorded. It takes us a few days to get the closed captioning up and up on the web. Um, and we have so many other great gardening resources. So if you're a beginner vegetable or edible, I like to say edible because of course a lot of us are growing fruits as well. Um, and you know, want to take some of the thinking out of you know when do I have to start these under lights or do I start them from a seedling or a direct seed? We have planting calendars. We have guides that help you if birds are your thing and you want to garden for the birds or if you're in a coastal environment we have a lot of resources to help you along the way so check out some of these resources use our hotline year round um, we also have a, a phone number that you can call if you'd rather talk to a human we have humans to help answer your questions um, and tune in uh, we're not every tuesday live we're every other tuesday live at seven we just announced um, our whole series going into July and think beyond gardening. If you have a, a well, we have information's, uh, information on uh, keeping your well healthy. We have information on ticks and preventing ticks so much more uh, outside of this gardening bubble as well. Um, and I think lastly, just a plug for the URI Master Gardener program. Um, and, and thanks to our Master Gardeners that are, are a huge part of this and helping to disseminate uh, all this really great information that gets generated throughout universities, uh, throughout our country. Um, if you have interest in becoming a URI Master Gardener, uh, we, are, we have closed the application period, but of course we'll be uh, opening them uh, back up for next year. We also have a home horticulture certificate. So for those that want this information, but not, might not be able to volunteer uh, just yet. Heather, thank you. You're a wealth of knowledge. This was awesome. I learned a ton. I realize I have still so much more to learn, but hey, it, that keeps me growing. So that's right, Sejal. Well, this was fun. Thanks very much. Yeah, and thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a good night. Bye-bye. That was great, Heather. Stopped recording. I did my dues.